he told me that I've just taken you off the pedestal. And I just went, Whoa. <laughs> I've never been so encouraged to hear anything like that in my life before. I thought, I never wanted to be on your pedestal. And for another thing, I'm not good at heights. So I thought, let's, let's just let's get, this, get this down. He discovered in that moment that all spiritual leaders don't give people exactly what they want, don't always get on with people when, they, when you think that they should, and it just doesn't always turn out the way you would want it to. And today, as we continue in our, in our series in, in Galatians, we're going to uh, meet two men who had that, a similar issue, where, they needed, where one needed to be confronted because of, of sin in his life. Two spirit-filled, spirit-controlled men for whom things didn't work out quite as they would have liked. And it's one of the things I love about the Bible, is that it doesn't try to sanitize every situation. You get the good, the bad, and the ugly. You get it as it is. And when somebody is screwed up, we know that they're screwed up. And I'm glad the Bible is not being written and that I'm not part of it because it would have looked a pretty sad story in many respects if my life was to, to be laid bare in the word of God as it is with some of these characters. And yet it's for our learning. It's for our good that we come into that understanding. And so we want to pick up our reading in Galatians this morning from Galatians chapter 2, and we'll read 11 through 16. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. And when Peter came to Antioch, I, that's Paul, opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in, in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law... No one will be justified. Tripping up or walking in step. Just to recap a little bit, Peter, uh, Paul had had, just after his conversion, and in a period of, uh, just yeah, in that first period of his life, he had had one visit to Jerusalem for about a fortnight, two weeks, 15 days, and he had met with with the apostles James and Peter and John and just had a, had a catch up with them probably outlined some of, some of the gospel to them but he hadn't received the message from them it was a message that had come from God and what we have learnt from this, this letter so far is that he was being challenged by an outside group of troublemakers in terms of his authority as an apostle and in terms of the, um, the truth of his message that, that he was presenting and this was a, a message that was mixing up the, the Jewish customs and laws and rituals with a faith in Jesus which was free of all of that. And one of the things which Galatians is teaching us, that, and he comes to it in chapter 5 and, and verse 1, that we, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so he, he doesn't want us to again be bound up with, with the slavery that these laws were bringing. And so we find that that uh, this, has been, this has been happening, he's been responding to this question. And now he comes and has the second meeting with Peter, in, this time in Antioch. The first time he was on Peter's turf in Jerusalem. That was Peter's hometown. That was his home church. And, P and, and Paul had gone there, and so he was, uh, he was in Peter's territory. This time now when they meet, 
Peter has come into Paul's territory. Antioch was Paul's, Paul's base. Antioch Church was where he had been sent out from on his first missionary journey. It was a, a, a key place for, for Paul, and he felt right at home there amongst this, this amazing mix of, of Jewish and non-Jewish Christians, and they all having this great time of fellowship, and the word of God was expanding, and it was just an amazing place to be. And, and Peter comes, and he meets up with, with, uh, with, with Paul and with these Christians at Antioch. See, Antioch had a, a sort of a great, a healthy population mix of both Jews and non-Jews. And this was being reflected within, within the church. Now, I, it's just as a, 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 as a background observation to this, and, and, and we, what we probably, what I hear a little bit today, and hear a lot about people talking about being filled with the Spirit and what it meant to them, and, and usually inferring that there was a time when they had a, a special encounter with the Spirit, and that's fine and that's good. But it's sort of like they, they, they talk as if that was it, that was a one-time experience, and, and that has been going on and lasting forever for them in relation to that. It was interesting, even just this last week, on, when I was uh, driving in the car, I heard Charles Price on, on Rima talking about it, and he talked about the fact that the filling of the Spirit... Is a, is, a, is a moment experience. Living and working in the power of the Spirit is something quite different, and that often comes out of a life of trials and testing when we see what happened in, with Jesus' own ministry. After his baptism, he went off for 40 days into the desert where he was fasting and was tested and tempted by Satan. And he came out of that experience in the power of the Spirit. And we find with Paul in his experience having had his con conversion experience and being indwelt by the Spirit, he was filled with the Spirit, and the efficacy or the, or the, the, the efficiency, the, the truth of his ministry came out of the, the ongoing filling of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit that came through a life of suffering. He was shipwrecked, he was hungry, he was cold, he was whipped, he was stoned, he was, you name it. And out of that experience, the power of the Spirit was evidenced in, in, his, in his life. Ephesians 5.18 tells us to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And a moment-by-moment, moment, day by day experience. It's not, it's not something I'm filled today and that's going to last me forever. But this is, this is something which I need to continually keep focusing on, keep, keep asking for the Spirit to keep filling me. And by filling, he's meaning controlling. His, Paul and, to the Ephesians was saying, keep on being controlled by the Spirit. Because it says the Spirit fills us as He is, engages with us, as He controls us, then the power of the Spirit is able to be seen in that. And so we, we find here that this was, this was what was, was happening in this situation. We come to this passage that we've read and we find that here are two men who were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who knew what it was to be filled with the Holy Spirit, who knew what it was to be acting in the power of the Spirit. Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost and preaches the most powerful message that, that uh, has probably been preached, and 3,000 people come to faith in Christ and are baptized on that one occasion. He knew what it was to, to be going up to the temple with John and to see a crippled man there by, uh, beside and begging. And, and they say to him, listen, we've got no cash, but we'll give you what we've got. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he got up and walked and went into the temple and caused a great commotion. He was living in the power of the... Both of these men knew that. Paul had seen the power of the Spirit operating in his own life. Both men knew what it was to be filled with the Spirit. Both knew what it was to operate in the dynamic power of the Spirit. So what went wrong? Paul was very confident as he encounters Peter that Peter had sinned. Peter was condemned by his actions. And he stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with Peter, eyeball to eyeball, and he's going to confront him over what he has just been doing as we read about in chapter, in chapter 2, 12 to 14. See, Peter had come to Antioch and he had entered into the spirit of the church. They were having fellowship together. He was eating with them. They were sharing in communion together. He, there was no, diff, no barrier for Peter. It was, was just 
life as, as usual. You see, he had gone through his own personal experience of breaking through this Jewish wall that was a barrier to them to have fellowship with non-Jewish people. In Acts chapter 10, we find that Paul had, uh, Peter had had this, this, uh, this vision. He had, was waiting for his lunch and he went up to his rooftop to pray. And in that moment, he goes into a trance. And in that trance, in that, he, he has a vision from God and he sees this sheet come down. And for the Jews, there were certain animals which were clean and they could eat. And there were uh, certain animals which were unclean and they couldn't eat. And so Peter has a look in the sheet and is just filled with unclean animals. And the, the message of God comes to him, Peter, kill one and eat it. And Peter is horrified. He said, I have never eaten anything unclean in all my life. And God in the vision says to him, Peter, don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. So kill one, Peter, and eat it. And it was showing him that there was, there was going to be an encounter with him. And then the story goes on where these, these men had come from a, 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 a Roman soldier's home, Cornelius. And they, he was a God-fearing soldier. And he'd ask, they're asking Peter, come and tell. Cornelius wants to know what it is about this message. And Peter, at that instant, went to Cornelius' home. He sat in his home with him, something he would never have done without that vision. So he knew what it was, that this was God's plan for, for them. This was God's new era. He was doing something new, something fresh. And so he goes and he has fellowship with him. And so now he comes to, to Antioch, and he's had this experience. He knows that this is all okay with God, and he's enjoying great fellowship. But as I said last week, when God is doing something, when something powerful is happening, God, uh, the devil will always see that there's some troublemakers who come in to stir it up and to, to, to derail what God is doing. And this is starting to happen in Antioch and Peter's having this great time and all of a sudden some of these troublemakers come. They've come they, Paul said that they come from James. It's don't... Most commentators would say, don't read too much into that, that James sent them to cause trouble, because James wouldn't have done that, because James and John had, and Peter had already given Paul the right hand of fellowship, as we saw last week, to, to do this mission. But just probably thinking that he came from James's church in Jerusalem. Now, Peter knew them. Peter would have known them. They're part of his home church. He probably had fellowship with them. He had been in their homes. So when they come... And they come with this very clear view that these Gentile Christians need to become Jewish first as a step to becoming real, true Christians. And they start talking about that in this church at Antioch and all of a sudden Peter starts to get sidetracked by that and, and he gets taken in by that. And the, 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 the scripture says there that, that Peter began to withdraw and separate himself from the Gentiles. So they'd be saying, hey, Pete, we're going to have, we're going to have a, a potluck today. Come and join us. Oh, I'd love to, but, but really, I'm, I'm going to be busy today. Can't, can't make it. And so they, he would withdraw himself. And he was withdrawing himself because of fear. And the question we ask ourselves, is this the action of a spirit-filled, spirit-controlled man? Who or what was controlling him at this point? Was it the Holy Spirit that was controlling him? Or was it something else? And I'm going to submit to you that it was something else because the scripture says that he withdrew himself for fear of the circumcision group. That's this, this Jewish group. We talked earlier about Paul not wanting to be a people pleaser in chapter 1 and verse 10. He wasn't going to do this to, to please men and get, get men's support and, and curry favour. This was the truth of God's word, so he was going to preach it. He was going to live it, whether anybody agreed with him or not. He was going to be a God-pleaser, a servant of Christ first, and, and, and let, let all the other stuff take its course. But in this instant, Peter, controlled by fear, becomes a people-pleaser to please these, these friends that have come through from, from Jerusalem. So people who are indwelt by the Spirit of God can cause people 
to stumble. Peter's actions were wrongly motivated. You see, he was doing it out of, out of fear. Compare what Paul says in that, in that verse in, Acts, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. He wasn't going to be a people pleaser, but now he is challenging Peter because Peter had become just one of those. Peter's actions caused others to stumble in verse 13. He was a leader. And where a leader goes, others follow. And others followed him into his hypocrisy. Others who had been normally happy to have this fellowship, Jews and non-Jews all together, now started to the Jewish people saw what these men were saying, they saw Peter's example and they followed Peter's example and also started to withdraw themselves from the fellowship of their non-Jewish friends. And so powerful and so strong was this influence that even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was drawn into this hypocrisy. You go back into Paul's story you find that Barnabas was one who had discipled Paul. He had taken Paul aside, taken him down to Cyprus and had, had, had built into his life, had encouraged Paul. And now he's being sucked in by this, this erroneous position. It was an amazing situation. And Paul has a message in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 about not causing a weaker person to stumble. Those of us who are enjoying a freedom in Christ, be careful not to put burdens on others that cause them to stumble. This was, this was a teaching that we were brought up with as young people of, of, not, of not putting anything in the way of another person that's going to cause them to stumble. And Paul goes on in, in, in Romans 14 and, and, and in 1 Corinthians 8 about saying he wouldn't, he wouldn't eat meat if meat was going to cause somebody else to stumble. Now meat was a real issue for them. Because uh, it was more than likely, if they'd been bought it in the market, it more than likely had been already offered to the gods. And so it became a, a real issue for, for the Christian community. Are we, if we buy that meat and we eat that meat that's been blessed by the, by the gods, are we becoming part of that? And so it was an issue. Some, some said, it doesn't matter, it's only meat, it's going to get cooked. If there's any contamination from the gods in it, it'll get cooked up, it won't be, won't be a matter, it won't be a problem. Um, and others said, no, 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 it's, 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 we can't touch it. And so it became an issue. And Paul said, if that's going to be an issue, he said, I won't eat meat. If it's going to cause one of my brothers or sisters to stumble in their walk with God. The third thing was that this, these, these actions were a denial of the, of the gospel, the very gospel, the very message that they had believed of freedom in Christ. It was, it was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I hope you're starting to get that little, little ditty because that, that was the crux of it. That was the basis of it. And they were denying that because now they were saying it's not by grace alone, through faith alone, it's by grace plus some, some Jewish laws, plus you guys getting circumcised, plus some off, looking after the feasts and the festivals, plus all this other stuff. And when you do all of that and you become a, a Jewish proselyte, a Jewish convert, then you can become a real Christian. And by their actions, they were actually showing that. It was like... Um, trying to walk a, 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 Paul was talking about here, they, they were not on a straight line and before breathalysers came in, um, if, a, if a person got pulled up and they were suspected of having uh, one too many, they would be asked to hop out and they, the officer would normally ask them, now go toe to toe along this line. Of course, if you wavered at all, that was pretty good evidence to them, that was all they needed to say, no, you're drunk, you, you pay, the, pay the price. Well, Paul is saying, you guys have strayed off the line. You're no longer walking a straight line here. And that needs to be corrected. But how would you and how would I and how should we respond if this was to happen to us? We need to recognise that the issue here is an issue of principle. It's not an issue of preference or of personal taste. Paul isn't taking Peter on simply because he, 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 he had a different opinion on that. Paul was taking Peter on because he had broken a clear principle of the message. 
It's a matter of scripture for Paul, not a matter of style. And the issue here is that the gospel in practice had been violated by the gospel, uh, the gospel rather, that they had violated the gospel of principle by the gospel of practice, by their practice. And people were being drawn away by that. They weren't living what they believed. And the challenge for us today in that is that if we say we're Christian, if we say that we've, we've, we're now followers of Jesus, then let's make sure for God's sake that, that our life declares that. There's nothing more confusing for a non-Christian friend to, to hear us say, yeah, I was in church on Sunday and I, I love Jesus, and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they see you doing nothing different to, to what they would do. Your lifestyle is the same. Your, your philosophy of a life is the same. There is nothing different. They want to see a change. And correction should always lead to restoration and not isolation and exclusion. You see, Paul's modus operandi for this, he's going to give it to us in, Acts chap in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, where he says, if you deceive somebody who's fallen in a sin, he said, you who are spiritual, and that's the key, you who are spiritual, restore that person gently, but be careful because you also might fall. You see, for Paul, in that verse, he's saying, it's, again, it's a matter of principle, not preference. It's a, it's a case of checking your own personal vulnerability. As I help this person in the sin, as I encourage them to, in their walk with God to be lifted out of that, I have to be careful because I could easily be trapped by the same sin. And so saying, watch your vulnerability. And it may be necessary to get somebody to guard your back spiritually. It may be necessary to put on the full armour of God, as, as we read about in Ephesians 6, before we engage. But it's examining our own heart to see that we're right. It's walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Over the years, Lois and I have done a little bit of wallpapering. We, when we were in France, we wallpapered a whole flat just so that we didn't uh, have to pay for every little hole that we'd put in the wall. As the, the council, when they came through, they checked and they said, oh, there's a hole there and there's a hole there because it was a new, new flat when we went into it. So they knew every hole that was in the wall was one that we'd put in. And, uh, and they would, they would penalise you for that. And, and for the French people, that was not, never a problem. They would just pay thousands and thousands of francs that the council or the, the landlord would ask of them. They wouldn't do anything about repairing it, but they'd take the thousands of francs. And, uh, and in fact, a friend of ours who was also in the same situation, um, when they walked into their flat, they, they got a camera and they took photos of every wall and, uh, and every hole that was in the wall. And they took a copy of those photos. That was before sort of digital stuff and, and all of that. They took a photo and they, when they went into the council, they said, now here's a, here's a file of photos of holes in the wall. We've got a copy as well so that when we come to leave this apartment, we are not paying for these holes. And so we, we decided we we're in England and we got a whole heap of paper, wallpaper for about 40p a roll, which was, was even cheap back then. And we went right through it. But one of the things we've done always, when we, we're going to start, <clears throat> we, we're, not, we're not perfect at it. We, we get by with it. We get a plumb line. And we, we set the plumb line up and to make sure that at least the first drop is going to be straight. And then the, if that one's straight, then, and we measure up to that, then hopefully by the time you get to the last one, you're still straight. But the plumb line was the thing which was going to make it possible to see whether it was right or not. And Paul is saying now to Peter, you wonder why I'm rebuking you? You wonder why I'm challenging you and correcting you? Well, I want you to know, Peter, this is my plumb line. The plumb line comes in, in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And he's really in that, in, in the original text, that verses 15 and 16 was just one sentence. And in that, Paul is giving a, a summary of, of, of the gospel. Let's just read it again because this, 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 this is what he held up against Peter and said, this is why, Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what he was trying to make them do. 
Look at the law, obey the law. That's what we're doing. That's part of our Jewish heritage. So we too have put our faith, that's we too, the, 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 gent uh, the, the Jewish um, believers, we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we might may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. That's it. That was his plumb line. And so as we think about that, it raises three questions for me, which I want to quickly, quickly touch on. And, and you, you measure it up against where, where you're at and, and, and in your, your life. And the first, the first question is, are we relying on who we are and what we've done for our right standing with God? Who we are and what we've done for our right standing with God. Peter's hypocritical, hypocritical behaviour was sending the message that his reliance now was on what he's done and who he was and not simply on the faith that he had in Jesus. And, but anything that we do as a consequence of that faith is an expectation that comes out of our love for the relationship. We don't do it to get saved. We do it because we are saved. We do it because we've been rescued from this life of sin. We are by nature sinners. Paul in Romans 5 and verse 8 said, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's no room for spiritual superiority or smugness. It's not of us. I can't parade all my good works and say, this is why I am who I am. This is why I've got favour with God. It doesn't work. I just come humbly to the cross and say, Lord, I am what I am because of all that you've done and all that you are. I have no other grounds for, for that. The second question is that, are we convinced that Christ's death is the only reliable basis for the right standing that we have before God? This is what he's asking in these verses. This is what he's saying to Peter. Paul was born a Jew. Paul had every spiritual blessing of that era. He had had the law. He had had, the, he'd had all the ritual. He was a Pharisee. He, would, he, he understood all of that. And as we've said in the past, he was progressing up the ladder far beyond his peers. And if anybody, if anybody could have got there on the basis of their good works and the basis of what they believed and who they were, Paul made it. He was, he was at the top. He had, and he had the certificates and the diplomas and the character and all the, all the references to prove it. But he said, no, that's not where it comes from. I'm relying totally and solely in what Jesus Christ has done for me and those count for nothing. They count for nothing. If they did anything, they showed me what a sinner I am and the needing of something greater in my life than, than what, uh, or what I had. And we need to see today, and many people need to say, see today, that it's not coming to church won't save you. You could come to the lighthouse every Sunday from now until eternity, and it won't make you a Christian. You can take communion as we've done it today, or the Eucharist, or, or the Mass, or whatever, whatever form it takes for, for you. That You can take it every day, and it won't save you. We take it because we are saved. We take it because we do want to remember what Jesus has done for us. Baptism won't save you. It's only through the cross. And Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, for he says that in the time of my, God, of my favor I heard you and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now is the, the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 10 and verse 4, he said, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. We sang that great, great song. It's a modern version of an old one that nothing but the blood of Jesus can take away our sins. The blood of bulls and goats could cover it. They, they highlighted the need, but it's only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse us. That's it. Nothing else. Because there is only, that is the only provision that we have. And are we convinced in our relationship with Jesus that it's only him that changes the way we live? We often hear people talk about believing in Jesus and trusting in Jesus, having faith in Jesus. 
But are they actually trusting him? Do you trust Jesus every day in the circumstances of your life? We can say here in this group, I believe in Jesus. But do we trust him? So when something happens in our life, can we, can we trust him? In Galatians 3, when we get to there, we're going to see that Paul says to these believers that they, they got on, they started well, but in actual fact, they had stumbled. They needed to go back to their beginning. You see, becoming a Christian just isn't a nice thing to do. It causes us to be created as a whole new person. It creates a whole new paradigm for us. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9 says, For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's it. You, they turned to God from idols. There was a complete change of attitude. There was no longer dabbling in sin. There was no longer going back to the old life. They were created as new people now and they had a new, new life and Paul was expecting them to live that way. And I guess the question that comes out of this as we, as we come to a close here, the question that comes out, out of this for us, as Paul confronted Peter, what impact did that have on Peter's life? Let's personalise a little bit. If we were ever confronted over something which somebody saw us doing which was not helpful, it wasn't good for our Christian life, it wasn't good for our testimony, what would it do for us? For Peter, it wasn't the first time he had been confronted. Jesus had confronted him on the beach in John 21. <laughs> I suppose you could say, well, Paul was a bit less than, less than Jesus, so it was probably a bit easier to handle. But did this permanently damage his relationship with Paul? Did he spit the dummy and, and no longer want to have fellowship with these, these believers, these Christians in the Antioch church? Did he reject Paul's perspective as being of no real value? We have to say confidently, no, he did not. It didn't damage his, his relationship permanently. This happened just before the Jewish council in Acts chapter 15. And when we get there and Paul's going through this whole thing again, we find that Peter is the one who stands up for Paul's defense. And in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, this is what, this is what Paul, uh, Peter says of Paul. Remembering he's been, been rebuked by him. He says, So then, dear friends, since you are looking toward this, Make every effort to find to, to be spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our, just as our dear brother Paul. This is the guy who ticked him off. Now he's writing to the Christians and saying, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. See, when Paul and Peter were indwelt by the Spirit, it created a whole new opportunity for them to deal with issues of life. Because Paul had acted honestly and biblically with Peter, he had saved Peter's ministry, saved his, his perspective, and he could say that he was free indeed. So how will you and I respond to spiritual correction? Will it damage our relationship with a person who spiritually comes prayerfully, carefully to help us? Will we split the dummy and say, I don't longer want to have fellowship with that church because somebody ticked me off in it? And so we'll find another church where they won't tick me off and let me live in my sin and not care? Will we reject their perspective as being of no real value? a test of our spirituality it's easy to give correction it's not so easy to receive correction I was sitting in my office one day at the Globe Bible and Missionary College and I had a group of three students knock on my door and they brought their Bibles with them I thought oh, we're going to have a Bible study wrong they came because they saw something in my life as their lecturer as the assistant principal of the Bible College they saw something in my life that needed correction. And they had the courage to do it. 
I didn't spit the dummy. I didn't say, oh, I'm not going to teach this a lot anymore. I'm going to leave this college because the students, they attack the lecturers. No, no, no. You've, you've got to take the attitude that spiritual people bring a spiritual response. And that's what Paul is saying in Galatians 6. One. And when somebody comes to you with that perspective, they could be saving your life. They could be very well saving your testimony and your ministry. And in doing it, be opening up for you some amazing doors of opportunity and blessing and influence that you might have not been able to have if the sin had been allowed to continue in your life. However, the choice is always going to be ours. The choice will always be ours. May God give us the grace to receive the correction if we need it, to give correction with humility and with a tear in our eye that people know that we come with a compassionate and often a broken heart. But let us also see that we want to stay true to the word of God, not just in our, in, in, in our belief system, but letting that affect us in the way in which we live.